Get back to your podium, Franks. Okay, we will now go to Community and Economic Development, chaired by Michael Lilliquist. Thank you, Gene. Joining me on the Community and Economic Development Committee are Council Members Murphy and Vargas. We have three items before us this afternoon. The first is a special tax valuation, adding additional eligible property classes to an existing ordinance. Uh, Ms. Katie Franks is here. Katie? Thank you, Michael. Uh, yeah, Katie Franks, Community Development. Um, I'm a plan, uh, development specialist. I'm accompanied by Tara Sundin, uh, our manager, and Jackie Lynch. She chairs the Historic Preservation Commission. So they're going to be here to answer additional questions. I have some images that will help you guys understand this special tax valuation, although I assume that you've all read your packet and you understand it better than I do even, especially you, Jean. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what we're doing today is we are asking, we're bringing you uh, one of the development incentives that you've heard about for the last couple of months. Um, it's a package, and this is an incentive for historic buildings. And this will affect buildings citywide, not just in urban villages. So what it is, what is special tax valuation? Back in 85, the Washington State Register realized that as people rehab their historic buildings, their property taxes went up. So the more money they put in, the more they were actually kind of penalized by having additional property taxes. So they set a program called Special Tax Valuation with, to encourage people to uh, rehab historic buildings and not add additional taxes, at least for 10 years. So specifically, what that, how it works is to be eligible, you have to spend 25% of the assessed building value, that's minus the land, so just the building value, and then the, the rehabilitation costs that you put into your project have to be approved by the local Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, the work has to be completed within a two-year period, and you have to agree to maintain the building over 10 years. And there are pretty strict um, standards. That they're the standards set by the state. And there's a penalty if you don't do that. So, and right now, we say that you have to be listed on the local Bellingham Historic Register. Although the state says, we've actually, when we updated our ordinance back in 2005 to be more compliant, um, and we became a certified local government, we made it pr pretty strict. So what we can, the state says that we're allowed to identify the different classes that we want to have be eligible for this program. Right now, local historic register buildings are eligible, and we've had five buildings take advantage of that over the last 10 years. We would like to have more buildings, more property owners take advantage of it. So what we're proposing is to add National Register listed buildings and any building that's contributing to a historic district, whether it be national or local. We don't have any local districts, but we may in the future. And that would really increase the number of property owners that could take advantage of this. Again, there are strict guidelines, um, but we'd like to be able to provide this incentive to people for their historic buildings. So just as an example, in downtown, the National Historic District that was designated in 2014, there are 130 properties that are eligible for this and 14 individual properties that are listed on the National Register. So all of these could potentially take advantage of this program. The Cascade Laundry Building, we've been talking to Sonia Max. She's the woman with her brother who bought this building that sat for quite a while. It's a bit of a conundrum to a lot of people um, on how to approach it. So in talking to her, she's pretty excited to take advantage of this, and she's hoping that you will vote today to amend the ordinance to include National Register properties and contributing properties. This building is not on any register right now, but it's eligible. It's eligible to be listed individually on the National Register, but it's also right now it's a contributing building to the downtown historic district. So she could come in tomorrow if you agree to um, amend the ordinance and apply. And there are other people who have come forward as well. So it not only benefits property owners, but really it benefits us 
in that we get to save another building, we get to have an, an enlivened and re, revitalized streetscape where there might just be a parking lot. So again, I, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer, and um, we hope that you'll vote to amend the property, the Special Valuation Tax Program. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Committee members, Roxanne? Well, I've worked with this policy in the past, and I adore it for everything that it does. Another thing I'd love to add is that when you manage these buildings and these properties, it's very expensive. So this also helps defray the cost in that sense, especially for keeping the historical nature of so many of our different properties. Thank you. I, I think enhancing our historic buildings is what helps retain some of the character of Bellingham, and it is very costly, so if there's ways that we can make it easier for that to happen. So with that, I move to approve. Okay, we have a motion for approval. I'll just say that I can think of, think of at least two city legacies this helps meet. Um, one of them is for a sense of place, preserving our history and locale, and the other is meeting our, our greenhouse gas, you know, reuse a building if you can and better yet, reuse a historic building. Uh, any further discussion? Any other committee mem council members? All those in favor of recommending tonight uh, the ordinance in the packet, signify saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, bring that forward, the positive recommendation tonight. The second item on our agenda. Thank you. I believe is a report on the housing levy. Um, this says 2012 housing levy fund status report. The 2012 housing levy, referred to as a home fund, is a voter approved seven year properties act levy lift. Brings in approximately three million, or actually actually just on three million, I think now, per year, for a total of 21 million over the seven years, starting in 2013 probably. And we'll have a, an overview um, on that uh, program and how it's going. Mr. Stahlheim. Thank you, council members. Uh, Public, uh, David Stahlheim, block grant manager for City of Bellingham still. So, huh? I still do, yes. Um, what I thought before I leave actually the City of Bellingham, I thought it'd be really good to kind of get an overview of the, the housing levy. We've uh, brought the council projects and we brought you performance reports and uh, within all those documents, you see all this stuff, but not really in a real clear fashion. So I thought it would be really helpful for us to kind of take a look at uh, the, the funding side of the housing levy. And in the levy, there was four programs. Uh, as, as everyone probably knows, it was a $21 million levy, $3 million a year for seven years. Uh, in the production and preservation program, $13.8 million. Rental assistance supported services, 4.2. Home buyer assistance, a little bit less than a million. And then acquisition opportunity loans for 875,000. Uh, administrative expenses, a little over 5% of uh, the cost went to administrative expenses, so $1.1 million to get to $21 million. So when you look at the, um, the levy, of course, I want to talk about uh, the funding, but one of the things that's important to, to remind ourselves is how we are doing with the production of, of meeting our goals under the levy. In the production and preservation, we set a goal of 417 units over seven years. We already have under contract 510 units, so we're far surpassing that, and we've already completed 226 units. So we're doing exceedingly well uh, with meeting the levy expectations there. Where those projects come from, uh, first off in the production program, uh, under contract, um, we have uh, Francis Place, which actually just completed in July, downtown in Cornwall, uh, it was called Cornwall Housing on Cornwall Street. Greggy's House, uh, two uh, duplex, it was a duplex unit, uh, three bedrooms each, uh, run by Sun Community Services. Under construction right now is Bakerview Family Housing, a farm worker project on, uh, for Catholic Housing Services. We uh, set aside funds for the acquisition of the Aloha property. Uh, when we start talking about fund balances, I want to uh, note that we have uh, in here the 1.125 uh, million out of this fund and also the 875 in the acquisition opportunity fund. If the project doesn't end up being a low income housing uh, project when you uh, go through your disposition process, th those funds will get repaid and there will be another $2 million back into the program here. 
We did an uh, opportunity with Lydia Place to help them acquire a property in the uh, Birchwood Court Apartments. And contracts that are pending, we have three, uh, one with Eleanor Apartments with Mercy Housing Northwest, which just got uh, announced this last week that they got their Housing Trust Fund Award for, I believe it was $2.8 million. And so they are well on their way. That, uh, that project, uh, I would anticipate breaking ground in 2016 uh, downtown, 80 units of senior housing. Uh, Pioneer Human Services, 1.2 million, and then uh, uh, contracts pending for 22 North, which is a Northwest Youth Services Opportunity Council project. So you see that we have uh, $7.2 million in the production program that we, uh, levy funds that we have already awarded, um, and many of them under contract. When we look at the preservation program, uh, a lot of projects under contract already, uh, some emergency repair, projects. Uh, we made a seven-year commitment to the Opportunity Council for repair of manufactured housing, $125,000 a year, uh, $875,000 total. Uh, we helped Lydia Place at their existing building uh, get up to some standards there. Dorothy Place uh, for the Opportunity Council, the Larrabee Residence, uh, also known as the YWCA building, and uh, Deer Run Terrace uh, for Bellingham Housing Authority. So all those projects um, are under contract and uh, most of them are, are completed or nearing completion. Contracts pending right now, uh, Interfaith Fourplex, um, we have uh, the contract is about to be signed in the next uh, two weeks. Uh, DV SAS uh, Safe Shelter, uh, that contract is, uh, has been signed by the city, uh, just need to execute it on the DV SAS side and then Every year we set aside $50,000 for emergency repair. Uh, so another $200,000 of funding there. So when you look at the fund balance, when all those uh, good projects are there, you see uh, $13.8 million uh, in the budget, uh, commitments of almost $9.5 million, leaving a fund balance of about $4.3 million. And again, that fund balance will go up by $2 million if you do not uh, uh, if the Aloha acquisition goes to something other than affordable housing, then that will increase by $2 million. But with all that fun balance, you think that woohoo, well, uh, many projects take a long time for us to kind of get to fruition uh, so we can bring you really good projects to consider. And so we've, we've actually had uh, quite a few conversations with our providers out there already. So I want to give you a sense of some of those. Uh, 22 North with Northwest Youth Services and Opportunity Council. Uh, they came in for their project last year for only 10 units, and what we were encouraging them to do is look at a larger project there, uh, perhaps a 40-unit project, and they're uh, studying the feasibility of that right now, uh, and I fully anticipate that they'll come in in 2016 for additional funding uh, requests uh, for both uh, units and operating assistance to the city. Lydia Place uh, wants to expand on their Gladstone property. Um, however, that uh, is on hold until they go through some uh, zoning approvals and some neighborhood plan approvals, so they have to get through that process. Uh, DV SAS is working on acquisition of property in the Birchwood neighborhood for new shelter expansion. Uh, they would want to help preserve that. And we've talked with uh, two projects, uh, Opportunity Council at a G Street, uh, fourplex and Mount Baker apartments that want to do some preservation projects. So when I did some uh, adding up, I think of all those uh, projects, I kind of estimated that it could be about $3.9 million of requests. So when you see that you have a fund balance of 4.3, uh, basically some of the projects in the pipeline are starting to show that uh, pretty much the, the levy could be um, allocated in the next uh, year or two years. There are a couple projects um, going back up to the list on production that um, have, um, you know, these projects that are not under contract, particularly Pioneer Human Services and then 22 North, they really do rely on some other funding sources and it'll be one of those things to have to monitor those funding sources. Uh, the Housing Trust Fund being a primary source of funding uh, to help those projects come to uh, reality. Um, it's possible that uh, only one of those projects could get funding through the Housing Trust Fund, so it could get delayed on our end, and those funds could become available. Uh, and so they have, under our uh, administrative guidelines, they have two years to get a project under contract. 
So they'll have uh, from right now basically another year and a half to get their funding in place uh, to keep those funds. Otherwise, they'll have to get those renewed uh, with the city. So again, uh, quite a few projects, great projects that we've been able to fund. Um, uh, fairly substantial fund balance, but there's, there really are a lot of projects that are in the works to kind of uh, start tapping into that. When we look at rental assistance and supportive services, uh, the seven year goal was to serve uh, 1,098 persons. We already have served over 2,000 people uh, in this program, and so we've well exceeded the goal um, there. We, when we budget this, we kind of look at two different uh, categories. We look at project-based services, because one of the things that was a pri priority in the levy was to help support the operating funds for new projects that come online. So the three projects that we supported were Francis Place, a Catholic Housing Services, Greggy's House, and Pioneer Human Services. Again, Pioneer Human Services is still looking for uh, making that uh, whole project uh, go forward, but those funds are reserved uh, for now. So that's almost $2 million over the life of the levy to support those three new projects. With respect to general housing services, um, various agencies, we've supported $452,000 of, of funding that are under contract or uh, have already been expended. Uh, the homeless outreach team, almost $300,000. Uh, we supplemented some rental assistance uh, to the Opportunity Council of uh, a little over $78,000. And as we look at the assumptions going forward, if, uh, the funding levels that we had uh, in the levy for 2016 were $175,000. If we continue to maintain that funding level through the life of the levy, that would be another $437,500. Uh, added on to that, uh, the homeless outreach team is only under contract through June of next year. If uh, the city uh, chooses to continue with the homeless outreach team, that could be $250,000 a year uh, or $875,000 through the life of the levy. So when you look at uh, the fund balance here, so you see the amount of money that we budget for project-based services, uh, the budget and commitments are equal. And for housing services, we have a whole $1,982 left uh, in this fund. So I think that uh, that fund is pretty well committed at this point in time. I do want to go back, though, when I, when I talked about uh, some of the production projects. We anticipate those production projects will ask for some rental assistance and supportive service funds to go with that. And so the, the uh, funding opportunity that we're going to be drafting for next year that I'll be leaving behind uh, for your consideration is uh, anticipating that those folks will come in with a request for capital dollars and a request to move money over into the operating supportive services fund at the same time. So you get to see those projects as a whole. Finally, the last program is the home buyer program. Uh, seven year goal was 50 units. Uh, under contract right now is 13 units finished or five. Uh, this is, uh, we are now working on the, the contract. Uh, it is being circulated right now for signature with the Washington State Housing Finance Commission. We came to council, uh, I believe, at the last meeting or the meeting before with respect to this. Um, and so in that program, we would have $300,000 going to the Housing uh, Finance Commission, uh, half of it for resale restricted and half of it non-resale restricted. When you look at the fund balance here, uh, after that contract, we'd have $383,000 left in the home buyer program. So that's a quick overview of the housing levy and fund programs. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Thank you, David. Committee members, any questions or comments from Mrs. Stahlheim? I guess not. Um, thanks. As you said, you've already presented to us before. It's nice to see it in this angle, too. Uh, it looks to me like uh, we're, as you say, mostly committed on most of the dollars and mostly beyond our, our production goals. And we're about halfway through the life of the, the levy? Uh, we're uh, in the third year of the levy, so not 13, 14, 15, yeah, so not even half, yeah. You finish your job too early. <laughs> okay. Dan. <clears throat> I uh, just wanted to, um, I have a question regarding um, page 109 of the packet here under production program. You've got broken out levy funds and then also federal funds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one um, component of putting together this 
plan is to leverage additional dollars um, from outside our community, and part of that's federal, but part of that could be other dollars. And um, I'm just wondering, in your opinion, are, are these programs, are these projects um, leveraging to the capability that they, that they could be? Yeah, they are. All I did was just show the federal funds that we're in control of, and so it's not the total project cost at all. And so in the last annual report, we identified between, for every dollar that the city allocates, we're getting about 8 to $12 in return from other investments. Great, thank you. Uh, David, the last portion under the home buyer program, it says only five units finished and we have 50 that we're committed to. Um, can you tell me why we're only at five? What, um, what are our challenges there? What, um, why is there only five? Um, well, there's a couple different things. You know, first off, um, the only units that I end up counting in here are those that have levy dollars in it. This does not count uh, our federal dollars, and so we had actually spent more dollars with some of the home investment partnership funds, and so there's more units that have been produced during this period of time, and so they're, they're really on target with what has been going on all the time in terms of production of home buyer units. Um, and uh, so what's gonna happen next, though, with the Housing Finance Commission is that we anticipate at least 12 new units will be coming online next year uh, as a result of that, and so I think you'll see in the next couple of years uh, uh, a lot more. Um, uh, Culshin Community Land Trust also got a Housing Trust Fund Award of $300,000, and so, uh, that was a financial issue for them as well to have other matching funds to help support this program. And so that will really help with them to keep pace with uh, that investment too. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think I'll conclude it. That item was for information only. Thank you, Mr. Stahlheim. We'll now go on to the third item. It is um, Consideration of amendments to Bellingham Municipal Code section 17.82 regarding multifamily tax exemption. This actually came forward uh, two weeks ago and was referred back to committee uh, to address some issues concerning the program as it may apply to Fairhaven. Um, I know I was hoping to change it last time. It didn't happen, but we're back to revisit that and any other issues. Um, uh, Ms. Sandine, do you want to start? Sure. Um since the public hearing was held on the 16th of November, um, I, I sent a memo out to you all. There was some confusion that was, I think, surfaced um, from some members of the Fairhaven Neighborhood Association. Um, and since that time, we've made a modification to our ordinance. Um, so we inserted uh, an effective date kind of term in there that the, the um, ordinance would go into effect uh, June 30th of next year, which would allow us time to get the um, correct information out to the neighborhood. Since that time, though, I have met with um, Brooks Anderson and several um, other neighbors. Um, I met with seven of them the other, I think that was last week, and I think they all have the information that they need. Um, there was confusion about, I think they thought we were rezoning property. I just want to be very clear to, to you all and those that are here and watching that we are not, um, this proposal does not um, change anything that someone can do with their property, doesn't change how many units or the size or what a building looks like or whether or not a building could be built in a critical area. Um, this simply um, incentivizes, and in this case, affordable housing for um, certain parts of the Fairhaven neighborhood. The staff, uh, when we were developing the proposal, we just looked at um, the zoning that, that is allowed in this neighborhood and we, we recommended where four or more units, because you have to have four or more units to, to be eligible, um, was allowed for the zoning. That's where we, we drew our boundary. So I think that's where, where we're, we've left off. Committee, committee members, any questions or comments? I'll go ahead and start. Uh, one of the reasons why I actually don't like the delay is uh, I'd like to resolve the problem, but also 
There are pending or possible projects in the rest of Fairhaven, the Fairhaven core area, where there are several large lots which might be developed and could be really good locations, and the developers or owners may want to take advantage of this. Can you uh, tell me what the possible effects might be in the other parts of Fairhaven that aren't being disputed? Uh, we are aware of a project in the core of Fairhaven that is potentially eligible. Um, my understanding is the director, Rick Suppler, has talked to the property owner and they are aware of, of this proposal. So a delay could impact, um, but I think, you know, we're, we are presenting a compromise um, given some of the um, concerns that the neighborhood rose about our proposal. Is it possible to have just the RT zone part of the delay, but to keep the, the core, Fairhaven core, uh, sure. effective immediately? Yes. Because then that would, that would address what Michael was talking about. I'm sorry, we had, I had some chatter with another council member. I missed the question. We could apply the effective date, the extension of the effective date to just the RT, mm. I believe two zone is what we're, yeah, RT two. And um, the rest of the, the area would come online immediately. Yep. Thank you. Tara, we've had a fair amount of feedback about the Donovan area of the Fairhaven um, some saying that this shouldn't be included in the ordinance, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are, what um, what you could provide us in that information. Sure. So the the, the feedback that we've received, and when I when I talk about the confusion from the neighborhood, it all stems. Sorry, I didn't say this. Um, to this RT2 area along Donovan. So, right there. So the, the boundary that we've proposed is the commercial core, which is in red, RT2, and David, could you point to the RT1 and 4? Um, so it's, it's all about RT2, and this is, an, is a, a part of, of Fairhaven that does have kind of a mix um, going on. There are some condos there, there are some single family homes. Uh, I think that what I've received from the neighborhood is concern about incentivizing um, additional development in this area. And I, I think it's really about a difference of opinion on whether or not this area should um, be zoned the way it is. So I think that's, that's where you're, what you're hearing. It's about, about that. But again, we are not proposing a zoning change. Dan? I'm trying to understand why RT2 um, is in this proposal. Um, my understanding is that it's fairly built out. There might be one lot left available um, that is in a critical area along Patton Creek or a sensitive area. And so I'm, I'm trying to understand what the staff's hopes are mm -hmm. in terms of um, are we trying to knock down buildings and build new Residences, or what is, what is the hope? No, in fact, the the law prohibits, um, you know, uh, the knocking down of this, uh, buildings just to replace new. In fact, a, a property has to be vacant for a period of one year to be eligible. Really, it's in the simplicity. In fact, I, I use this example with um, the Fairhaven neighbors in the Fountain District. The entire Fountain District is a multifamily tax exemption zone, every single part of it. Now, under that, you gotta look within that district to see if you can even build what we're incentivizing. In that case, there's certain parts of Fountain that you can't build for, for more units. Um, so it's really an overlay, um, an incentive overlay, but you have to dig into the zoning. In this particular area, yes, there are not a lot of redevelopment opportunities, but there really aren't a lot of redevelopment opportunities in all of Fairhaven. So there's, there's a, <laughs> there aren't that many lots left, left undeveloped. Um, but so the, the area in the critical area, Dan, this would not mean that something could be built there. Um, I mean, it's all, it, it could be built there regardless. 
the zoning allows for it. So it was for just sim simplicity. Sorry, Roxanne? I'd just like to make a motion that we would remove RT2. Second. Um, I'd like to make a comment. I recognize you, Kelly. I actually count um, easily two and a half full blocks of undeveloped space available in Fairhaven. You know, some of them are large developable portions. So I, I think there's enormous opportunity in the Fairhaven core area, which is why I would like to see it go forward on that. Mayor Kelly? I don't think in this particular case there's a, a real significance about this. You know, it could be in, could be out. It's not going to make a, a great bit, deal of difference. So this, I'm not arguing one way or the other. But one of the goals that I have is to make both for the neighbors and developers zoning more predictable and more uniform and more consistent. Um, and so using the existing d zoning and putting an overlay on the top is not creating another separate little parcel that is, some, it, it is adding to the complexity. This one is not significant, but as a general rule, we have a lot of block by block, area by area zoning, which is um, where I think uh, our zoning is much more complex than many other cities our size um, in the state. And so it really does make it less predictable and consistent, which is what we hear. The neighbors uh, deserve to know what to expect in their neighborhood, and people that want to develop their property deserve to, under, to have some kind of consistency with that too. Mm -hmm. So this one is not significant, it's not bigger, but for me, it's going the opposite way that I'd like to see us discuss our zoning. Roxanne, do you understand your motion? You suggested striking ART2. What about, did your motion include anything with regard to the uh, delayed uh, effectiveness? Because if not, I'd like to uh, amend your motion to include striking the uh, delay in effectiveness for the Fairhaven area, so the part that remains would become effective the same date. Any objection to that amendment? Okay, so we have uh, a motion. Does everyone understand the motion? Is there any further discussion of the motion to, yes, Pinky. I, I do have a question, because I just want to, completely understand what moving, removing R2 um, does to the ordinance. Um, Tara, could you tell us whether or not this causes any sort of complications or does it increase complexity or, or does it still head us in the right direction of making things simpler? <laughs> it, it can be done. We're going to, the exhibit will be changed to remove that area. Uh, and we'll take out the, we'll strike out the um, effective date term. And we can prepare that for you for t this evening. Roxanne and then Jack. Well, I just wanna say that if it gets too complicated down the road, we could go through the process to re-add it and revisit it, especially, you know, as the area might change in the future. Jack. When staff says it can be done, that means that it's complicated and complex. So that's staff speak. <laughs> so to um, maybe clarify the motion, uh, the motion is to modify Exhibit D to remove area RT2 and then to strike the uh, language under Section C about the effective date for Fairhaven on June 30th so that it's now the same effective date. Any further discussion of the amendment? Uh, the oh, wait, I have, somebody asked me a question and I'm gonna ask it. I forgot to bring it up. Um, the, the, the biggest reason behind this, the whole exercise, Tara, I was asked, was it a cost shift or an incentive? Uh, it's an incentive. So uh, the, the developers or owner of the property wouldn't pay taxes for a certain period of time, in this case up to 12 years, because we will be requiring the affordable housing component. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify saying aye. 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 Okay, so we now have an amended motion. Is there a motion to pass the ordinance as amended? Or to recommend passing the ordinance as amended? I'll move it. Thank you. I move that we pass the ordinance as amended. The motion now is to pass the amended ordinance. Jack? 
I had uh, uh, to speak to the. I mean, I, I I don't particularly care about removing RT2. I think that's a bad idea. Um, to me, it seems like I agree with the mayor and with Tara that that uh, that you know the consistency of what we have is important, and um, I don't see any reason why we need to be removing it at all. But I wanted to speak about the Barclay issue a little bit, uh, in just shifting over to the uh, to the other area. And I, I want to get back to this, but first of all, I wanted to ask David about the demonstration ordinance that that was brought up and we had talked about quite a bit and got kind of hung up on the transit issue. Um, I wanted to know what, you know, where we are with that and if it's coming back to council. Um, yeah. At the, we, d we don't have any demand for that um, interest in that ordinance, so it has not been a priority to come back and deal with that. Uh, I know that uh, Rick has had some conversations about transit proximity, and so been working through some of those issues, And uh, but at this point in time, it's not an active thing on the work plan. Okay. The reason why I brought that up is it get back to this ordinance. Um, in the demonstration ordinance, staff was really interested in having a quarter mile to transit um, as a, a provision for, as a criteria for whether or not the incentive was going to be applicable or not. Uh, in this case, for the multifamily tax exemption within Barclay, uh, if you look at the map uh, for, for Barclay, there's areas that are three quarters of a mile away from transit that will be eligible for uh, for an incentive and I just want to you know if we're going to have consistency uh, to me it seems like if we want to go and pass the three-quarter mile then we should go and pass that also for the for the demonstration ordinance and yes I, I'm interested in seeing the demonstration ordinance if you're talking about um, interest but I'm not gonna be here for much longer so do with it what you may. So, but so the upper, the northeast corner of that is about three quarters of a mile from Woburn Street, which is the pinkish line. So back to the um, simplicity versus complicating the ordinances. We have not looked at that radius or that distance on any of the other four. So we already have this in downtown, Old Town, Fountain, and Samish. So I'd really want us to avoid applying that just to Barclay Village. The, the developable property in that area is um, the further away you get from Wilburn, the, there's more critical areas. So the area that's most likely to redevelop in this site for the, the planning um, uh, personnel that have, have given me this feedback is closest to Wilburn, I can tell you that. But sure. really want us to avoid kind of digging into that that much detail. And again, this is, we, in, in Barclay, we were, we were looking at areas that are zoned um, today to allow this type of development. No, I'm not opposed to it. It's just okay. that I, I wanna be able to, at least consistency to the demonstration ordinance, which I would hope that would come back. Kelly? So the, it, and this is my, my understanding of the, the goal of this is to increase affordable housing in our city, which is, to me, the biggest, one of the biggest goals we have where housing is concerned. So um, I think one of the things we hear, and th this isn't subsidized housing, this is affordable housing. So it's not, I mean, it's not um, um, supported housing, it's subsidized housing. So these aren't, necessarily like Francis Place developments. These are just affordable developments for working people. And I think it's important to have that kind of um, housing unit available city, you know, citywide or within all of our urban villages. So I think that the goal without the transit, though I share some of your concerns about that, it's supposed to be walkable. But I think there would be people who would be willing to, to, you know, walk further 
and have that not be a restriction on being able to have an affordable unit to live in. So that's that's the only reason I um, would also join Tara in asking that we don't put a special restriction on Barclay because Barclay is an area where there is not a lot of affordable housing being built oh, housing. and we'd like to see some. Uh, whether or not people could just choose to do it, that's, that's fine, but um, I think in the end, I'm looking af out right now after the people that are looking for affordable housing. And if that's the way they get it, then I'd like to support them getting it in Barclay as well as other places. Okay, uh, those are really good comments. I mean, this program, I, I strongly support it in that it targets in two ways. It targets affordable housing, not just any housing, uh, gets a subsidy and only in certain locations where we believe it's most appropriate to put development, well-served, good walkable communities that we've already treated specially. Um, any more comment on the motion is to uh, recommend passing the ordinance as amended in committee. Yes, I'll be supporting that tonight. I think, you know, I, I appreciate the mayor and the staff coming together with an alternative, but to have this sit around for six months and talk about it and debate it, and we have received quite a bit of email from people over there, so I think the best thing to do, take it out now. If sometime down the road it could be brought in, that would be different. So I'm going to be supporting the motion tonight. Okay. Jack? And so will I, but um, I wanted to, I don't know, it seems like about once a month I'll go and read the climate action plan that we have for the city, but um, not really, I, I haven't read it for years, but I did read it recently. <laughs> um, but one of the things it says in there, though, I thought was very interesting, according to this, is that uh, one of the provisions, one of the recommendations of the climate action plan was to have the multifamily tax credit exemption tied to, uh, you know, green standards, mm -hmm. you know, green building standards. And that, you know, you wouldn't get the exemption unless you built to, well, they said lead, but, you know, wh whatever the standard was. Um, but that's the thinking that we had uh, in 2007. So I'll just put that out there. Just as a reminder, uh, in the housing levy, we actually do have a, a sustainability standard in that. So everything that we fund with our funds go towards that. I would imagine that there's not enough incentive in this multifamily tax exemption to get to that standard. I don't think you would see any takers because we did the financial analysis of providing the affordable housing units and I think it's just right there at that margin right now. So I don't think you would get any projects come in if they had to build, build to a higher standard under this. Unless we did it citywide for uh, all construction. Yeah, exactly. Okay, any further discussion? Committee members, all those in favor of the motion to uh, recommend approving the ordinance as amended, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we'll bring that forward with a positive recommendation tonight. That concludes the committee. Okay, we will be back with Committee of the Whole in 10 minutes. Good job.